there anything, I have everything except for two screen only. And I can just stop to set to the main. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. It's usually a small crowd. You guys are uh, 150% more than last year, so that's great. Um, so Europe is a, a really small course. It's designed for students who are interested in doing research. Um, and uh, we put the slides up on, um, on Google Drive and we've exported a PDF. So you can look at this later. The address is up there. Uh, it'll be available on the Europe website, which I think you have no problem finding. But make sure you're looking at the right deck. So we put this warning slide at the beginning of each deck because the decks all look the same. They're just some key dates are changed. Okay. So uh, I'd like to get to know a bit about you all personally later, but um, you know, for information's sake, we'll go through the, this part first and you have questions, then please let me know. Okay? So my name is Min. I'm a faculty member, associate professor of our school. Uh, I teach information retrieval, uh, machine learning, and natural language processing. So those are my things. So you can think of uh, Google Translate, Google Search, those types of things I know how to teach. Okay? So, um, this is for all of you interested in starting to take your out for next uh, semester, meaning SEM 1 of next year. But really, your op is a course that happens for the entire year. So uh, if you want to do your op, you should sign up as soon as possible, even before the semester is over. And then uh, work with your supervisor to start working over the summer if you happen to be available during the summer. Okay. So um, I'm part of the undergraduate office at our school, and so you can find me and uh, Ms. Quek, who is the administrator in charge of Europe, and we are both in uh, COM1, just on the other side of next to the, you know, the student lounge. So what is Europe? Well, basically, it's a chance for you to try to do undergraduate research. If you always thought, hey, you know, it's interesting, I heard about these people doing research, it sort of sounds cool, I don't know what that really is, but I, I'd like to try it, okay, and see whether it's right for me, or maybe you think, well, yeah, you know, maybe graduate school is nice, I, I'd like to go to the States or somewhere else for graduate school besides here in Singapore, then uh, maybe Europe is a good chance to see whether that pathway is right for you. Okay, or maybe you don't know and you're thinking, well, internship is great, but I just want to see whether the grass is greener on the other side. Let me try something different. Okay, so what does research entail? Actually, it's um, something that you probably have learned already in JC or secondary or at uh, Poly, which is uh, the scientific method, right? So the scientific method is basically hypothesis testing. You come up with an idea, you try it out, you compare it against some control mechanisms, Right? And you see whether it made any difference. Right? And you do this one time through, uh, and that usually takes an entire year for undergraduates because you're learning the basics first. So importantly, one of the things that happens at the very beginning is, uh, oops, sorry, is um, a literature survey. So a literature survey is the part where you have to um, go through with your supervisor, find papers, academic papers that are related to what you want uh, to research on, study them, and then come up with a good understanding of what's going on. And even at this stage, uh, even if you're only doing research for three months or so, you will be close to the very best researchers in the world who know about this problem. Okay, And that is because there's just so few people who concentrate on the specific area which you're doing research, that you can already start to stretch the boundaries. Okay? By the end of your Europe, which you may dovetail into FYP later, you should be pushing the bound. You should be the one person in the world who knows the most about that particular subject, even more than your supervisor. Okay? So it sounds challenging? Yeah, it's a little challenging, but it's also a lot of fun. Okay? So that will be the first half of what you're doing. Okay? It's a literature survey, understanding what's what's going on in the field, and then uh, trying to figure out how to go from there. All right? So sometimes it involves attending research seminars, okay, like this one here, uh, where you can uh, go to other seminars that are happening within the School of Computing and try to branch out on, on knowledge, okay, and then see whether those ideas that you're uh, listening to from other speakers can cross-fertilize your own ideas about how to do research in the area that you're specializing in. Okay? 
Then uh, typically in the second semester you do a proposal and implementation of something new. You know, it could be a small a change, it could be a major change. And very, very critically, I think a lot of students overlook this, you have to be able to communicate those ideas to someone else. In particular, the people grading your year off. Right? If you cannot tell them what you've done, then you fail. Okay? Because it, uh, research is only good when other people can understand it. Right? Okay. So in SOC, Europe comes in two flavors. Okay? Uh, basically, there are two modules called CP3208 and 09. That's for the first SEM and the second semester of Europe. Okay? Um, there are some general prerequisites. They're just m mostly to make sure that you're on track to graduation and that by doing research, which is less well-formed than a module, okay, because it's sort of independent, right? You're not going to be, you know, stuck in a hard place later on if you don't do too well, okay? So those are what those things are, okay? Now, as I said, there are two options. You can either do a two-semester Europe, which most of our projects are like. 90% of our Europe's are actually for two semesters, okay? And I'll tell you why later on. Or you can do a one semester Europe if you're, let's say, uh, you have friends who are not enrolling this semester, but maybe next semester they're thinking, okay, maybe I want to start in January of Europe, but they don't have enough time to do it. Okay, uh, to do a whole year, they can take a half year. Okay, and um, usually what that means is that they do something more in addition to make up time. Okay, so they can do um, additional parts of the Europe during the summer. Uh, formally or continue it with a final year project. Okay? Any questions so far? No? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so if you take the standard Europe, which is two modules long, this is what your, your work will look like. Half of your grade will be given to you by your supervisor, you know, who you choose in the department to work with, and half of it will be given by two independent examiners, uh, hopefully those examiners, at least one of them, will be in the same general research area as what you're um, interested in. So for example, if you take a networking project, at least one of your examiners will also be knowledgeable of computer networks and will teach it right, you know, for a living, for example. Okay? And how does it break down? Well, as you can see there, uh, part of it comes at the beginning of the first semester. So here you have, uh, for example, 10% of your grade that comes at the beginning or the first semester. Okay? And then the next 40% is due to the second semester, 3209. All right? So you get some formative understanding of how you're doing, and that's basically just about your literature review and how you're doing and meeting with your advisor for the first half. Okay? Now, you only get the grade for Europe at the very end. So you complete 3208 if you're doing the two semester version. And after, let's say, December of next year, you'll get an IP grade, an in progress grade. Okay? So there's no difference between your final grade for CP08 and 09. They will be exactly the same grade. Okay? So your IP grade will be transformed magically by the registrar to whatever grade is actually going to be after the examiners and your supervisor confer and then award you a final grade. Okay? So in the other track, you can either do just a single semester up and say, you know, I just want to dabble in it, I want to try it out, okay? Or you can uh, dovetail it into a full-blown FYP for an entire year. So then you're basically doing a research attachment for maybe uh, a year and a half, okay? And some supervisors may make this explicit. They'll say, okay, you want to take a one semester Europe, but please, you know, when you sign up for Europe, uh, make sure you're on the track to doing an FYP, okay, uh, with me. And the same thing can happen of the two semester version. There are some people who decide, okay, after one, se one year of Europe, you've done enough to get somewhere, but, you know, we'd really like to help you to make a scholarly publication, have your name in lights, you know, in a scientific paper, then maybe you take another FYP with that supervisor as well. Okay? But, uh, you know, that's up to you and your supervisor to negotiate. Okay? So in the one semester version where you're only taking CP3208, you have the same division. Okay? 50% due to the examiners, 50% to your supervisor, but it's a bit more compressed, right? 
So you have to give the entire 50% from your examiner, uh, sorry, your supervisor by the end of the course, right? Okay. So here's how it works. Uh, tomorrow, uh, in fact, you can, you can get the forms from me today. You can get an application form for your op if you're interested. Uh, do take one anyways, even if you're not sure. Okay, and uh, it's a very simple form. It's just some paperwork for us to uh, go through and make sure we have everything. So you need to just tell us, and then we will check whether you uh, satisfies the prerequisites. You know, 60 MCs, 3.8 CPA, uh, etc. Okay. If you're a USP student, we'd like to know that because if you're a USP, you can use this to satisfy certain criteria in the USP program. Okay. This is the application form. But um, actually, the application form is not very helpful because on its own, it doesn't mean anything. It just means you fulfill the requirements it's for us to check. What really makes a difference is the project assignment form because you're going to be doing a supervised research project along with a supervisor and perhaps some, uh, some people from her team or his team. Okay, So that's the more important part. You have to fill out this form which basically asks you to go to a, uh, a supervisor who's agreed to supervise you, fill out the information about the project number and the title, etc., and then we'll assign you to that. Okay? So uh, do this as soon as you can. Uh, your uh, applications are rolling, so you can process it at any time. So uh, we'd like to encourage you to do it before finals time. So although it says 7th of April here, it's not a hard deadline. So if you have friends that you say, oh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what type of module to take next semester. And you say, hey, why don't you do, you know, an independent research, you know, like I'm doing. Uh, you can tell them about it even after the end of uh, 7th of April. Okay. So uh, you may be fine thinking, well, that's great. Uh, I want to do Europe, but I don't know where to find a project. Okay. And that's a very typical problem, right? Because you have your particular interests. You may not know who in the School of Computing has worked in that area. You may, uh, depends, okay? But one way you can do it is to look at project proposals itself, okay? So uh, our faculty actually put up some project proposals, but because Europe is such a small program, now you can see there's only a handful of you here, uh, supervisors don't actually put up many projects for Europe. Okay. That does not, by any means, say they're not interested in taking your op students. Okay. It's just that lecturers, just like you and I, are fairly lazy, okay? and they won't do work unless it's absolutely necessary. Okay. So what happens is we also have to produce project proposals for another type of project module. Right? That's the FYP, which is uh, compulsory for certain programs, especially if you happen to be in computer engineering you are mandated to take an FYP, okay? So the department must produce enough project proposals to ensure that we have enough projects to cover CEG students, okay? What does this mean for you? It means that when you're looking for your proposal, you have several different ways of choosing a project, okay? You can look at um, the project proposals that are strictly for Europe. Okay, so I'm going to show you them. My dashboard looks a little different from yours. Okay, so here are some. There are some uh, about biomedical imaging. These are my projects uh, on various things uh, related to natural language processing, information retrieval. There are other things uh, on, you know, uh, comp compilers and um, uh, operating systems work. And um, Stefan has put some other uh, algorithm uh, type of projects up. Okay, so you can see here, there is not a lot to pick from, right? There's only 11 projects. Okay, but um, you know, there is much more to choose from. So if you go to this list of FYPs, you can see there are a couple, uh, at least 150. And there are many more lectures to choose from. So what I would do, if I were you, is to go through the FYP listing, okay? as well as the Europe listing, as well as, you know, use Google, type whatever you want, let's say artificial intelligence, NUS, SOC, okay, see which faculty members come up, okay, and then see whether their interests match yours, okay. Now, if they do, then I would say, you know, if they've proposed a project, you're in good luck because 
you, they already have expressed interest in your area. Okay. If they don't, then you may have to write them an email. Okay. You send them an email and say, hey, I'm a potential Europe student. I'm in year two, year three. Uh, would you mind meeting me for 15 minutes? Okay. And, um, you know, because lecturers, just like yourselves, they're lazy, they're busy, they may not respond right away. So try to, you know, egg them a couple times, nudge them once or twice, say, you know, I sent you an email. Uh, are you interested? You know, I'd like to, I can drop by anytime and, and talk with you. Okay, so do do this uh, so that you get a, a better chance to understand what uh, projects are like. Okay, I don't know how many of you have a specific interest in a particular area of computer science. Uh, sir, can you tell us what you're interested in? AI. AI. Okay, you're? So? Uh, NLP. Okay, what about any of the other people in the room? You guys have any idea what you want to do? Parallel computing AI, okay. Any others? AI and algorithms. AI and algorithms. Algorithms. A lot of AI folks. What about the two of you? Machine learning. Machine learning. Okay, that's AI. Uh huh. Yeah. AI. Okay. Wow. I'm so impressed. I'm so happy because I'm part of, you know, doing AI as as part of my research too. So uh, if you're all AI related uh, interests, parallel computing algorithms then you know you can talk to me about who potential lecturers are but also do shop around I think I want to emphasize this to you okay because Europe is not a small amount of MCs okay I tell this even uh, more so to FYP students it's eight MCs right it's two modules that you get a linked grade for okay so it pays for you to shop around Okay, you just, you know, like you buy a new phone, you go to different stores, right? Or you look at different plans. You want to choose a group that has the research style that matches what you think. Now, granted, most of you have never done research before and you don't know what it means to do research. But I'm sure that if you go to one store versus another, you have a preference. Okay, so if you don't shop around, you're going to say, well, that's what research is like. I'm going to just do it with this person. Okay? But if you talk to a couple of different people, you'll see that there are differences in the way that professors and their students interact. Okay? So it behooves you as a smart consumer of Europe to talk to different people. Okay? So um, I, I would encourage you to do that. At least talk to two, if you can, three different profs or their senior students to see how Europe would fit for you if you were to do a particular problem. Okay? Okay, now, of course, you can propose your own project if there's something you're really keen on. Like nowadays, there's a lot of hype about piano and Keras and deep learning networks and you want to do a project like that. You can also propose your own, right? You can say, well, I, I really want to learn this toolkit and stuff. Um, maybe I can approach, you know, Min to give me a project on deep learning. Okay, and then you can say, well, this is what I think, all right? And then you can work with that professor to craft a project that's uh, suitable for you. Okay? So if you're going to do that, you can propose your own project that places the burden on you to write up your, your description rather than use the ones that they've given. Okay? And then uh, they have to agree to that supervision. Okay? So I've already told you the, the some of the projects. So that's the screenshot. Okay? Uh, there's a little known fact about Europe, um, not many people invoke this, uh, actually you're given a budget from the undergraduate office to support the communication of your Europe. So if you ever find that, for example, that towards the end of Europe, you need to evaluate your project, okay, in some way. Sometimes, you know, you'll hear year three or year four students say, please take my survey for my FYP, you know, because I need to show that my system is better than that other crappy system, okay. Then uh, you need to sometimes pay people to do this type of work, right? So we have a budget for that for Europe students. You can use it for that or for printing or anything else that you want to use it for. Okay. Now, uh, some of you uh, may be in certain programs. I don't think any of you are in the CB. Anyone in Compile here? Any one of you USP students? Okay. CS students? Okay. So for the CSS uh, students, 
Uh, if you happen to be a Turing uh, program student, a special program student, you have some exceptions that can be invoked okay, to satisfy that. Otherwise, it just counts as a normal uh, a module that you would do for um, research work. Okay? So if you happen to fit any of the exemptions, do uh, go to our undergraduate office, get the form, and then fill it out whenever you can. Okay? It's not in any rush. You can do this after you're almost done with your up, and we'll make sure that the credits lie where they're supposed to be. Okay, so uh, Europe is actually a very meaningful experience. A lot of people who go through Europe end up going for higher degrees and if they, even if they don't, they end up with a very strong independent research skill which is what we look for when we train students for PhD. You know, either here or any other institution abroad. It's the same idea. Okay, so um, actually we have an NUS level award called the Outstanding Undergraduate Researcher Prize, which is meant for both Europe students and FYP. But guess what? Many people who win it are Europe students, okay? Because they're people who are younger, who spend more time dedicated to research. You guys are usually self selecting to take Europe, and uh, for a good reason, they do more outstanding research. Okay, FYP, if you know FYP, you know some seniors taking it, FYP is a project. It doesn't necessarily mean research, so there's no R in it, right? So, uh, you know, if you're doing an implementation-based project for FYP, you're not eligible for these types of prizes. Okay, so during a year up helps us have a rough idea what it's like for a faculty member or what it's like to acquire permanent head damage through a PhD program. All of that is, you know, a compressed one-year version of what it's like to do research under the uh, supervision of a professor and their team. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in uh, natural language processing, Hui Tao, who teaches our NLP class, is another uh, uh, person who does this. So he has a number of general uh, interests in machine, uh, sorry, natural language processing. Uh, one of his students also took Europe, and I think um, he actually also won the, the Undergraduate Research Award, and I think he also produced a scientific paper, if I'm not wrong. Okay, um, there are some minor details about Europe, but uh, I'll just leave this up for you guys to, to look at if you're interested. But uh, it's time for me to just get your opinions and questions, and um, you know, ping you out about what you're interested in. So let's go around the room and introduce ourselves again. So my name is Min. Uh, I uh, teach currently information retrieval. I taught our um, machine learning course for the first time last semester, and I did an absolutely terrible job. So I'm going to improve a, a lot better next time. So uh, I do most of my research uh, based on scholarly digital libraries. So that means, for example, uh, Google Scholar. That's one thing you can think of. But what do I mean by that? I mean actually using natural language processing to machine read articles that you and I would write as scientists. Okay, so that you can automatically extract scientific knowledge from the things that we write. Okay, so that's my pet interests. Okay, so uh, why don't we start with you, Miss, and we'll just go around the room and can you introduce yourself, your year, your program, and why you're interested in AI or whatever. AI and information security. Okay, great. Okay, so there are a number of professors who do information security. One that is particularly pertinent to you, I think, um, is a lady called Rizlin Thing. So let me see whether I can find her work here. Okay. Yeah, so she has a number of uh, projects that she has written um, that have to deal with information security uh, as well as uses some AI techniques to explore. So you can look at some of her projects. We have other people like Terrence Sim, uh, who sits next door to me. He's looking at biometrics. That's also information security in nature. If you're looking for more like networking projects, there are people in our networking group who also look at information security, but from that you know, other side of the fence 
and there are good projects there. So you can ask me for names too. Okay, sir in the back. Uh, my name is Yusel, and uh, I'm a student. So uh, I'm interested in AI because I just find it um, it's a very, very different way of like, thinking about writing a program. And it's able to achieve uh, things that, we, uh, that wasn't possible in the past. So that was really interesting. So I want to uh, explore uh, the field of machine learning and AI and see uh, what, what kind of thing Okay, so AI is a very general field, and even machine learning, we need to differentiate, for all of you interested in that, uh, a, a between applications of machine learning and the theory behind machine learning itself. Those are very distinct. When you talk about all the, the glorious news about AI beating XYZ and this and that, we're talking about applications, meaning that I have a problem and I need a hammer to fix it, right? When we talk about machine learning, usually we're talking about the hammer itself, right? We're improving the hammer, the tool, and we're making certain assumptions about the type of problem that we're trying to solve using machine, and that shapes the algorithm that we're going to use, okay? So it really depends for all of you interested in AI and machine learning, what your interests are. Are you more interested in showing that an application can be improved with the use of machine learning technologies, or are you really trying to do something theoretical uh, to really understand what it means uh, for learning to be achieved and how to improve it, okay? The latter is much more uh, mathematically rigorous, okay? I happen to be extremely bad at math, okay? But uh, my students are better than me, so that's okay. Uh, so it depends really what your interests are, right? Okay. So if you have a specific interest area in AI? Okay. Great. All right. What about you, Miss? Your name? Uh, my name is Archana. Archana? I'm in year one from computer engineering. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think I'm more interested in like how machine learning because I'm actually quite fascinated with the brain. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so those are very different parts. Yeah, they all loosely relate to AI. AI has a biological influence, but it's very limited. Okay, so uh, the, the tie between, you know, cognitive psychology and uh, the math, which is basically just math, okay, uh, is, is uh, a very big divide between AI and, and what uh, people in the press think it is. You know, you read a lot of press reports, they're like, oh yeah, you know, soon the human brain will be obsolete. Oh, that's so untrue because the way that we do artificial intelligence and machine learning is all math. It has nothing, to, very, very little to do with biological influences. Okay, in fact, a lot of the, the AI math was invented in the 1970s. Okay, it only can be run today because of the hardware that we have around. So um, a lot of the, the, the big brouhaha about AI is because you know, of Moore's Law and other things like that have, have made uh, those algorithms now tractable, right? If you take uh, complexity, you know, about you know, n log n and n uh, linear time algorithms, and a lot of that comes about from there. So um, for gaming, uh, our actually some of our machine learning professors are very interested in decision making, and decision making can come in the place of games. So especially for like card games, turn-based games where there's complete information. I won't tell you what that is, okay? But they're working on algorithms to help to do decision-making. So um, that's with a field called uh, POMDPs, Partially Observable Markov Decision Processes. But never mind, uh, that is something that people are actively investigating in our school, and they are world leaders for that, okay? Uh, sir in the front. Uh, my name is Bobby, I'm year two CS. Also interested in AI. Okay. And about that, uh, specifically in like automation of tasks. Like a lot of the a lot, a lot of things have been automated by machines. So in order to what further things that now can be actually automated by machines and how like a lot of jobs will be replaced by machines in the future. So I'm interested in those kinds of uh task automation areas or regarding neural networks. Mm -hmm. uh, also interested in algorithms and also security as well. 
Okay, so you're all over the place. That's great. So uh, hopefully through Europe, you'll, you'll refine some of your interests. So uh, deep learning or uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning in general, if you're looking at application areas, there are many. So it depends on, on what your, your field of interest is. Um, deep learning uh, came to prominence mostly through speech recognition. We first found that you know applying deep neural networks to speech recognition got 30% less error and people were amazed because they'd been studying it for decades getting practically nowhere okay and then uh, you know those types of neural architectures have been played off in many different areas and they now impact vision they now impact uh, natural language processing uh, they impact decision making uh, systems okay so uh, things of that sort so again um, I would say for that there are lots of professors who are interested in applications so it depends uh, a bit more on what application area that you're interested in to, to look at that. Uh, so if you're thinking of, again, um, uh, uh, I don't know, the media group, we have some people dealing with social networks, we have people dealing with computer vision, we have people doing the opposite and looking at computational photography, how to make pictures look better with this crappy, you know, uh, from the five megapixel sensor that you have in your phone. Okay, all those types of things uh, can be accomplished through uh, deep learning. Deep learning also has one other thing that you should uh, be aware of, is that you have to handle data at scale, okay? Because uh, deep learning requires lots of data to learn anything. It has lots of parameters, and when you have a lot of knobs to fiddle with, you need a lot of observations to set those correctly. So it means when you do a Europe in any type of large, uh, big data, deep neural network type of work, you're going to have to learn how to process large amounts of data. Okay? Yourself? Okay. Um, can I, uh, I want to do your rock because I'm uh, considering postgrad. So okay, great. So just trying to get a taste of like, what is it like first. And then I'm interested in um, both parallel and AI, mainly decision making and uh, optimization. Yeah, and then I, I, I'm interested in both because I thought both will work well together. Yeah, so um, there are a number of professors who do the planning parts, like uh, Martin Hens. Uh, who's probably more famous for his sailing exploits in the newspaper. Uh, he's got a, a lot of projects uh, on that. It's not listed here right now, but maybe he hasn't put some up. So he's, he's um, famously, he's done some uh, commercial work. He has a company called Friar Tuck that uh, did some projects and products for NASA. So you think about NASA, they have you know, very, very complicated logistics and uh, lots of different things going on. So uh, importantly, they have to schedule all of these things, right? Okay, so um, he, he had a product which he sold to NASA to, to do its planning. And so if you're looking at those types of interests, um, which are very much uh, a, a mainstay of Singapore. I mean, if you look outside our window, we have Jerome Port over there, right? The PSA logistics are, are world class. Uh, they're also trying to improve the way they um, you know, automate the port. So those are all algorithms that, that require planning, decision-making, and parallel computation. So uh, Martin would be one, but there are plenty of other ones. Uh, Roland, um, you can think of a couple others as well, but you can talk to me as well. Okay, uh, how about yourself? Uh, I'm Hong. Hong, I'm okay. CG student. CG? Uh, first year, but uh, I'm really interested in NLP. Okay. Yeah, so I've spent the last uh, winter break, you know, uh, research about uh, Word to Vec, uh, Doc to Vec, uh, LCM, okay. related things. And I'm also involved in uh, um, competition by NUH about uh, you know, uh, text classification mm -hmm. based on this chart summary. Okay. Uh, so I'm really interested in natural processing language, especially in you know medical areas. Yeah, so I think Europe would be a super yeah, so um, NLP, uh, we have three professors, of which I am one, who do uh, most of our NLP work. Uh, Hui Tao, who was on the slide earlier as a student, uh, is our main core professor in NLP. Um, he's currently looking more at grammatical error correction. So, uh, for example, when students write essays and they're not native speakers of English, how do we help them uh, write in the style of uh, international American English? Okay, um, but there are other projects that are uh, of interest to him um, on text classification as well. So uh, 
with respect to healthcare, there are, uh, uh, there's a student in my group doing uh, looking at discussion forums in healthcare. Um, we also have a uh, professor, uh, Chua Tatseng, who deals with um, uh, user-generated content. So we mean, for example, Web 2.0. You know, what you post on Facebook, what you post on forums, etc. Uh, that might be of interest to you. So all of those types of um, internet speech that we produce a lot of nowadays, we want to know how uh, you know trends evolve, how to predict them, uh, how to tell things whether they're real or fake. You know, fake news is a big big thing these days for whatever reason. Um, those are algorithms that uh, we can apply natural language processing to. So um, all three of us, you know, myself, Tatsang, and Hui Tao would be uh, maybe good fits for you. Okay. Okay, and I think that's pretty much the last slide that I have for you. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, if we I didn't cover them with you now, uh, you can send me an email. You know, I don't bite; I just send you an email back. Uh, but you can also find Miss Quack um, in the UG office. She has all of the administrative capacity to clear out any red tape and also to tape you up with red tape if she doesn't like you. Okay? So that's all I have for you. So if you have any questions, just come and ask. Yes?